I'm Max Hawthorne. Although I'm best known for my Cronus Rising series of sci-fi thrillers, I also dabble in paleontology. It was my research that solved the mystery of plesiosaur locomotion, as well as why some of them had such long necks. Today we're going to be discussing the Megalodon shark, specifically evidence that suggests the adult sharks were primarily scavengers. Before we dive into said waters, however, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. I first published my controversial Megalodon scavenger theory back in 2016. I do extensive research for my novels and have an impressive fossil collection, including numerous prehistoric shark teeth. It was my study of these teeth, as well as bone fragments left over from the shark's meals, that painted a surprising picture. Fossilized Megalodon teeth exhibit unusual morphological adaptations that stand out among all other shark teeth. I began to wonder, why were the teeth shaped the way they were and what purpose did they serve? The answer was surprising. Most people believe that Megalodon was a high-speed predator that hurtled up from the depths and slammed into unwary whales. But was this true or even possible? Could a 50-foot, 40-ton shark with a skeleton made of cartilage chase down a healthy whale? The key is speed. We know that per a 2018 study by Jonathan Houghton from Queen's University, Belfast, that a breaching 26-foot basking shark maxes out at just over 11 miles an hour. Moreover, Houghton also calculated that, based on body size, the shark used a similar amount of energy breaching as its warm-blooded cousin and fellow mackerel shark, the great white does, and was able to travel at a similar speed. Thus, we know that a white shark 26 feet long would breach at around 11 miles an hour. We also know that the bigger a shark gets, the slower it becomes, one of the pitfalls of a cartilaginous skeleton. This becomes apparent when the skeletons of very large sharks are subjected to extreme pressure, such as the intense muscular contractions required for locomotion. Muscle contractions tend to be limited by what they're anchored to. This bus-sized whale shark is a prime example. Due to its soft skeleton, its speed is a fraction of that of the gigantian blue whale, which can be four or even five times its mass. This video by whale researcher Jess Tudor shows him slicing through the vertebra of a large basking shark. Despite the shark's spine being calcified like the jaws of predatory sharks, even with a non-serrated knife, he is able to cut through it like cheese. There you go, it's a basking shark, I say. The reason being is that these bones are way too thin. There's no way I'd be able to do that with a real bone. If that was a mammal, that'd be a bone. See? So, how fast would a megalodon two times the length and eight times the mass of a 26-foot white shark be? The obvious answer is slower. But how slow? The aforementioned whale shark, which matches or even exceeds a meg in size, maxes out at around 5 or 6 miles an hour. Was an adult meg this slow? Possibly. However, to be safe, Let's go with established science and say that an adult megalodon had a maximum charging speed equivalent to that of a 26-foot white shark, which would again be around 11 miles an hour. Physics suggests that it was almost certainly slower, but we'll be generous and work with that. So, how does that velocity stack up with known cetacean speeds? Let's start with cruising speeds. A 2022 study by Hutchinson et al. estimates Megalodon had an absolute cruising speed of 1.4 meters per second, which equates to 3.13 miles per hour. The cruising speed of blue whales is listed at 5 miles an hour, sperm whales at 3 to 9 miles an hour, humpbacks from 4.9 to 9.4 miles per hour, and orcas at 8 miles per hour. At cruising speed, it's no contest. In terms of maximum speeds and based on known studies, fin and blue whales can do 28 to 29 miles an hour, say whales 31 miles an hour, orcas and dolphins around 35 miles an hour, and pilot whales an astounding 47 miles an hour. Which means that, unless caught napping, any of them would leave an adult megalodon in the dust, effortlessly evading it and causing it to expend a tremendous amount of calorie burning energy for nothing. So how was the shark getting its food? Let's examine its teeth. First, let's compare the jaws of Megalodon to those of the shark it's so often compared to, the Great White. As you can see, 
At first glance, the jaws and even the teeth look similar, especially those on the lower jaw. The mandibular teeth share a remarkably similar design, like pointy daggers or spear points. This is because the shark shared a similar feeding strategy, the classic fork and knife technique. When many species of sharks feed, the mandibular teeth swing forward like a fork and dig into the prey item, holding it in place. Then the upper jaw or maxillary teeth go to work. The lips peel back and the upper jaw hyperextends before powering down to excise a mouthful of flesh. It's in the upper jaws of the two sharks wherein we find differences. This primarily applies to the principal or primary teeth, i.e. the centermost ones in the jaw. The central teeth of Megalodon were drastically different than those of the white shark. Whereas the white shark's teeth, even at large sizes, maintain a triangular blade-like shape with coarse serrations, the teeth of Megalodon are more robust with semi-cylindrical cores. They tend to have curved blade-like cusps that descend from the main body of the crown and flare out at the root like flanges, flanges lined with tiny serrations. They're shaped more like stone or bone chisels with hacksaw-like edges versus the white shark's steak knives. Amusingly, would-be detractors of my theory have boisterously claimed that said teeth were like that simply because of the shark's overall size. But is that true? Are big, chunky teeth a requirement based on increased mass? Let's examine another megatooth shark, a beast that is considered a likely ancestor of Megalodon and was also its contemporary for millions of years, Ototus or Carcaricles chubutensis. Per Wikipedia, chubutensis grew to an impressive size, 44 feet. Based on the upper mass estimates for a 20-foot great white, that suggests a fish weighing close to 27 tons easily as big as a good-sized megalodon. Yet for all its size, and again per wiki, although the teeth of Ototus chubutensis are morphologically similar to teeth of Ototus megalodon, they are comparatively slender with curved crowns. Curvature aside, in terms of dorsal ventral shape, the chub's principal teeth were more like those of the extant white shark than those of megalodon. As examples, let's examine this tooth from my collection. A massive UL3, I should think, as well as this example from Wikipedia. As the mirroring shows, this was almost certainly a central principal tooth. Both of these teeth were from maximum or near max sized chubs, yet neither possessed the flared cusps extending out like flanges from a semi cylindrical, labially flattened core, as we see in Megalodon. Instead, the tooth morphology is more like that of the extant Great White in that there are labiolingually flat and triangular cusps with serrated edges. This overwhelmingly suggests that chisel-like teeth were not a requirement for large flesh-eating sharks. So why did Megalodon's maxillary teeth evolve the way they did? The answer lies in what the teeth were used for. An entry on Wikipedia, which, interestingly, appears to have been added on a year or so after my scavenger theory began making waves, suggests that the shark's thick teeth may have been used to target the heart and lungs of whales, with the teeth being adapted to bite through tough bone. I disagree. The first problem with launching an attack on the rib cage of a living whale is, as we learned earlier, catching it. But putting that aside, there's the problem of actually breaking through said rib cage. The bones of cetaceans are robust and strong, including their ribs. When a predator goes after a prey item, it seeks to do so in a manner that offers as little risk as possible. Hence, white sharks tend to target the haunches of similar-sized elephant seals in order to avoid a retaliatory strike. An adult meg was twice the size of most of the whales of its day, which are the ones it tended to target. Its fear of injury from a retaliatory strike was probably low but powering into a whale and smashing into its rib cage with teeth set in jaws of cartilage would have been pricey. Numerous teeth would have broken off or been dislocated, leaving the attacker hamstrung. Sure, those teeth would have been replaced within a day, but when it came to actually feeding immediately following the attack, the animal would have been hampered. Then there's the question, could a megalodon by sheer bite force smash through the rib cage of a decent sized whale when attacking, or even randomly bite through the ribs of a carcass. That broaches the topic of jaw strength and bite force, and I must say, 
I have my doubts. Having jaws made of cartilage is the limiting factor. In the words of R. Aiden Martin, director of the Reef Quest Center for Shark Research, strength may be defined as resistance to deformation. By the above definitions, shark jaws are much less strong than those of either humans or crocodiles, as it takes considerably less force to warp or distort the jaws of sharks than those of either humans or crocodiles. This is borne up by the anatomy of a shark's jaws. As these images by Elasmo Branchologist Simon DeMarkey illustrate, the only relatively hard part of a shark's maxilla and mandible, as well as its spine, are the outermost layers which are coated with tiny calcium crystals called tesserae, which make them stronger. The core of the jaw bones consists of a cushioning material similar to ballistic gelatin, which is designed to absorb shock. This creates a jaw that is strong but flexible and will bend or flex under heavy load. Unlike predators with bony jaws, gel-filled jaw bones tend to limit actual jaw strength and hence bite force, which in sharks is based on pressure being applied to needle-sharp teeth. This creates the illusion of extreme bite force. This is borne up by a 2008 article interview with UK's The Telegraph on shark bites, which stated, Researchers have found that sharks in fact have very weak jaws for their size and can bite through their prey only because they have very sharp teeth and because they can grow to be so big. During this interview, Dr. Daniel Huber of the University of Tampa stated, Pound for pound, sharks don't bite all that hard. Huber's statement is backed up by his formal study in the journal Physiological and Biochemical Zoology, 2008, Huber et al., which stated, Large sharks do not bite hard for their body size. Sharks with relatively high bite forces for their body size also have relatively more pointed teeth at the front of the tooth row. Moreover, species including hard prey in their diet are characterized by high bite forces and narrow and pointed teeth at the jaw symphysis. That last part contradicts with biting through rib cages, which certainly constitute hard prey. Nor did Megalodon have narrow and pointed teeth at the jaw symphysis. Its maxillary teeth were broad and relatively blunt. But what about relying on its reinforced teeth to just power into prey? Would that have worked? Multiple fossils in my collection suggest otherwise. For example, this large section of whale rib from the Ace Basin of South Carolina exhibits horrendous bite marks on it, the sheer size of which overwhelmingly suggests a series of bites from an enormous megalodon shark. Yet for all its size and purported power, and what were obviously repeated attempts, it failed to shatter the bone via direct assault. Why? The shark was likely two times the length of its target at eight times its mass. If its bite force was so incredible, why would it have to make so many attempts to bite through the ribs if it managed to do so at all? Another example is in this whale caudal vertebrae from my collection. Again, here we see numerous punctures from the tooth tips of a feeding megalodon. Over and over again, and from a variety of angles, the shark chewed and chewed on the whale's tail region. It certainly must have been hungry. It appears to have taken many bites before, finally, it managed to shear through one section of the vertebrae, as shown, removing a chunk of flesh and bone for it to swallow. So, if its bite force and tooth design didn't allow it to rush in and pulverize the chests of its warm-blooded victims, crushing their hearts and killing them, why did the Meg have these robust, uniquely designed teeth? My research overwhelmingly suggests they functioned as rib splitters. The thick, column-like cores of the maxillary tooth crowns were like railroad spikes and were capable of withstanding tremendous pressure. They were designed to be forced in between whale ribs. At the same time, the blade-like cusps that flared out were ideal cutting instruments, like a log splitter being hammered into a log. When it came time to feed, the spiky lower teeth would stab into the victim, immobilizing it, then the upper jaw teeth would come into play. Undoubtedly preceded by a brief feeling out process, the teeth with their narrower tips would slip in between the ribs before pressure was applied. Think of it like you inserting your hand into a glove and feeling about for the finger openings. You can't see them, but you know they're there and you could feel them. As the tooth crown sank deep between the ribs, those flange-like cusps with their hacksaw-like edges would start to slice into the ribs on either side, cutting into them. 
Keep in mind, however, that this was a sandwiching technique. It worked best with the principal teeth being present on both sides, and missing teeth would have hampered the process. Once the teeth started pushing in together, the pressure would build and cutting would increase until pop. The rib cage would collapse and, like a nutcracker cracking a nut, the shark would tear away an enormous mouthful of flesh and bone, including the nutritionally valuable heart and lungs. Now, some might ask, why the rib cage? Why not the rest of the carcass? Firstly, we have to remember that cumbersome adult megs would have had a tough time catching fleet flippered whales and were likely resigned to feeding primarily on carcasses. They hunted by scent. The problem was, with seas filled with other large sharks that included smaller megs, Chubutensis, the giant mako shark Cosmopolitatus, and even great whites, the carcass of a 25-foot whale would go fast. It would likely be largely stripped by the time an adult megalodon arrived. But the lesser sharks didn't have the dental tools to break open a dead whale's heavy rib cage with its hidden treasure trove of rotting flesh. Hence the adult megs with their mighty jaws. Which brings up an important point. The megs' unique maxillary tooth style and feeding technique only worked on dead whales. Living whales weren't about to lie there and say, okay, let me just hold still so you can line those teeth up on the side of my chest. That's it. A little to the left. Okay, and go for it. No. Their teeth were designed like the conical premolars of a spotted hyena. They were designed to bite through bone, but using a wedge technique to minimize tooth loss and compensate for the shark's cartilaginous jawbones. I should also point out that, based on the morphology of the principal maxillary teeth, there appear to have been several subspecies of Megalodon shark. Based on my experience, the most common type had narrower crown tips with more flair to the cusps. There were also ones with broader tips, and extremely broad tips, and even ones with a crown shape that appears to have lost the narrow tip altogether. Instead, these crowns evolved into a design reminiscent of a parabola, a parabola arch if you will, except that these teeth came to a point whereas quadratics are smooth. In this case, the teeth were still designed to function as rib splitters. Their parabolic arch represents an incredibly efficient method of load. In this case, the load represents pressure on the arch, aka tooth crown, during insertion between two ribs. Instead of relying on a narrower crown with flaring cusps, the parabolic arch shape allowed the tooth to withstand the most thrust at its base, i.e. the root, while simultaneously withstanding compression pressure courtesy of the crown's overall design. This example from my collection demonstrates an almost complete parabolic arch shape to the crown, and as you can see, the entire crown now performs the log-splitting task, whereas teeth with narrow crown tips relied on their cusps to do so. But why were there several subspecies of Megalodon possessing different principal maxillary tooth shapes? I should think the answer was similar to that of the fangs of Smilodon fatalis, which, per Dr. Frank Mendel from SUNY at Buffalo, were designed to deliver a fatal bite to the throat, especially the throats of bison. They were likely species-specific. Since the teeth in my collection and others show that these assorted tooth crown designs existed simultaneously in different parts of the world, and at times even in the same regions, it is likely that the assorted subspecies of Megalodon tended to target different species of whales. Whales that were the smallest or had ribs the closest together would have been most efficiently scavenged by sharks with the narrowest crown tips. Ones with medium wide to wide tips would have fed upon larger whale carcasses or ones with ribs more widely spaced. And those with parabolic arch-like tooth crowns would have fed upon the largest whales or those with the widest spaced ribs. Of course, this whole rib cage nutcracker notion is all just a theory, right? Is there any proof? Why, yes, there is. We have fossils to back it up. Oodles of them. First, let's look at this large section of whale rib, a piece from my personal collection, which is believed to be lower Miocene at around 23 to 16 million years old. Said whale would have been quite large, and if its age is correct, it represents a huge cetacean existing at a time when most whales were the size of today's pygmy right whale. It is remotely possible that this represents a Liviaton, if that is the case, it could mean the raptorial sperm whale was around much earlier than is currently believed. Regardless, we're here to focus on meg teeth and their application. As you can see, 
This 6 inch tooth replica lines up perfectly with the groove that was made in the rib. The narrower portion of the tooth score represents a maxillary tooth with its outward curving crown sliding along the edge and we see a deeper, wider gash in the bone where the flared cusp cut in and began to do its work. The attempt was unsuccessful, however. One, the actual tooth used appears to have been much larger, more like 7 inches in length, and two, even one that size apparently wasn't big enough to break through this particular bone. Still, it demonstrates how the teeth worked in principle. Of course, against the smaller whales that were Megalodon's preferred prey, the method was far more successful. The fossil evidence I've acquired overwhelmingly suggests that the adult sharks relied largely on carrion, i.e. the rotting carcasses of dead whales, as their bread and butter. Predictably, Megadon fanboys have been outraged about my theory since the moment it was released. I imagine to people who've always pictured the shark as some giant killing machine, it must seem crazy. But is it? Great whites with their flat, triangular teeth feast on dead whales whenever they get the chance. How big of a step would it be for a carnivore with teeth specifically adapted for dismantling carcasses to do it full time? Of course, as the saying goes, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. We don't have a time machine to see the extinct mackerel shark in action, so let's see what the fossils say. Here's a perfect example of evidence of a meg gingerly feeling out the ribcage of a dead whale before applying the full power of its jaws. There was an initial scratch, followed by a feeling out bite, and then, once the pegs were properly fitted to their holes, a full power bite was applied. The result was a fracture that caused this rib and undoubtedly several others to shatter. If this had been a predatory charge ending in a lethal strike, there would have been no need for this feeling out process. There would have been a single explosive bite. There wasn't. We see it again here. Multiple grooves from soft bites, followed by a deep fissure that resulted in the ribs failing. And we see evidence of it again here. There are two scores on one side of this rib, likely caused by an ill fit or pressure from a non-principal tooth, and on the other side, deep gouges and the rib breaking up. This type of feeding damage appears predominantly on ribs. We see evidence of it on both sides of them as well, proving that the log splitter technique was in fact used. But it requires a huge shark with massive jaws in order to pull it off. As this piece of fossilized whale rib demonstrates, smaller sharks simply didn't have the size, bite force, or specialized teeth to shatter a whale's rib cage. Metaphorically speaking, all they could do was mess up its clear coat. Long, deep gouges, however, are the hallmarks of a scavenging megalodon, and we see evidence of this on whale ribs again, and again, and again, and again, 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 again. It's the same story over and over. I think you get the point. Interestingly, the technique wasn't limited solely to whales. Other species such as dugongs, which were often targeted by subadult megs, were also on the menu. Once they passed the neonate stage, the principal maxillary teeth of Megalodon inevitably developed that characteristic morphology that helped them feed on carrion. In the case of dugongs, however, which have tightly packed and robust ribs, not to mention among the densest bones in the animal kingdom, almost no bone marrow, the technique appears to have been less effective. Rather than being able to shatter the ribs of dugongs with a single fitted bite, the shark appears to have been forced to use repeated bites, like chewing, until the ribs finally gave way. We see this technique applied over and over again on the ribs of extinct dugong, the hacksaw edged cusps of the maxillary teeth gnawing away like a dog on a bone until they finally worked their way through. The evidence for adult megalodons being primarily scavengers is overwhelming. But does that mean that that was the only thing they ate? The answer is no. If a 50-foot meg encountered a sleeping or wounded baleen whale, or one struggling to give birth, would it make a kill? Certainly. At the same time, it knew instinctively that catching an alert cetacean that swam two or three times as fast as it did was a losing bet. It was far easier to use its phenomenal sense of smell to lead it to delicious carcasses which, with its tremendous size, it could easily appropriate from other sharks. One other point. 
There are die-hard and or size-obsessed Megalon fanboys out there that like to go around spreading disinformation. They've claimed that my theory states that Megalodon was just a scavenger, and have also stated that there were not enough whale carcasses to feed a breeding population of Megalodon. Both of these statements are erroneous. Not once have I said that Megalodon was an obligate scavenger. Instead, and as you've seen, the theory is that the younger, smaller, sub-adult sharks, which were still relatively quick and nimble, were able to successfully prey upon the comparably sized, smallish whales of their day. They were primary hunters and secondary scavengers, whereas the bulky, cumbersome adult sharks, which were largely incapable of catching fleet-flippered whales, were primary scavengers and secondary hunters. It was like an inverted pyramid, and if you think about it, a perfect food web. You had the far more numerous smaller megalodons, not to mention other killers like Chubutensis or Cosmopolitatus, out there making kills. Each of these kills left behind what? A partly eaten carcass. And at the bottom of that food pyramid, waiting in the wings, was the megalodon broodstock. Massive adult males and females which, with their cavernous jaws and rib-splitting teeth, were ideally suited to what evolution had designed them to do. They were eaters of the dead. It was a function they eagerly fulfilled for nearly 20 million years, and they were good at it. Thanks for taking the time to watch this documentary. Down the road, I'll be discussing other Megalon topics, like how big they might have gotten and what caused their extinction. In the meantime, be sure to check out the free book section on my website at www.maxhawthorne.com. Thanks again, and stay safe out there.